Coming up next, it's last night's viewer call-in program with Ron Paul, the 1988 Libertarian Party candidate for president. He joined us to talk about the Libertarian Party, its membership, and its goals. He also offered his views on the U.S. handling of the situation in the Persian Gulf. In the 1988 presidential election, Mr. Paul finished third behind Republican Vice President George Bush and Massachusetts Democratic Governor Michael Dukakis. He received slightly more than 430,000 votes, or about one half of one percent of the total votes cast. Ron Paul, former pr uh, presidential candidate from the Libertarian Party, do you agree with President Bush's decision to send American troops into Saudi Arabia? No, I disagree, and the Libertarian Party certainly disagrees with this. Uh, the traditional American foreign policy was non-intervention and neutrality. It kept us out of war, out of foreign adventurism for 150 years. And uh, the 20th century, all this has changed. We think this is wrong and will lead to no good. Um, good evening. We're very pleased to have with us Mr. Ron Paul, former member of Congress and also a presidential candidate from the Libertarian Party. We'll be taking a look at the Libertarian Party and discussing their views on the economy and foreign policy and a number of other topics. If you have a question or comment for our guest, now is the time to call. The lines are open. If you're calling from the Eastern or Central time zones, you can reach C-SPAN by calling 202-628-2525. Uh, if you're calling from the Western time zones, 202-783-2727. If you're watching us from outside the U.S., the numbers are on the screen. Uh, Mr. Paul, first of all, when you talk about the, the Middle East, how do you put it in the context of the Libertarian Party? Under what circumstances does the Libertarian Party believe that the United States ought to send troops to fight a war? Well, in some ways, the Libertarian Party is an old-fashioned party, and we still believe in the Constitution. You know, we, and the Constitution is a pretty good Libertarian document in many, many ways. But on foreign policy, it does not authorize a president to wage war. And blockades are uh, waging war. And we don't think he has the authority nor the uh, moral right to involve himself in something that's none of our business. It doesn't serve the national security interest. As a matter of fact, it's very damaging to the national security by exposing us to a potential holocaust, a horrible war over there. So we think it's very, very dangerous uh, and detrimental to, the, to national security, unconstitutional and immoral, and uh, very expensive too. So therefore, we would say just stay out of there because they've been fighting over there for hundreds of years and they're going to continue to fight. And we're not going to bring peace among all the Arab nations over there. If you were president, how would you respond to uh, Saddam Hussein's decision to invade Kuwait? Probably just totally ignored it and the price of oil probably would have been back down to $17. The price of oil is skyrocketing now because our troops are over there. And uh, some people even argue that we're, we're serving oil, big oil's interest by going over there and protecting the coalition between Arabs and big oil. And uh, I, I think it would be over and done with. I mean, you have to really look at history and decide whether it's, it's uh, even worth considering. The fact that Kuwait was carved out as a new nation by the British 70 years ago, I mean, where do we start? We're still arguing here in this country about how to satisfy those people in this country that we injured many, many years ago, in particular the, the Native Americans and Native Indians. So uh, in this sense, it's only a short 70 years ago that they artificially carved this nation out, and they're still upset in Iraq about this, and they, they have to settle their disputes. These are major problems. Uh, we, how would we have felt if, uh, if uh, the Soviet Union sent troops over here when we thought it was in our best interest to do something in Grenada. I mean, we don't want people meddling over here, and we shouldn't be meddling over there. Well, how do you see the, the events in the Middle East as they relate to America's economic situation? You know, it's, it's interesting. Some uh, have argued economically that uh, the economic turndown was you know, caused by this escalation of uh, warlike activity over there. But the truth is, is the, econ the economy was in a sharp turndown before this came about. And this is just escalating, uh, speeding it up, making it much worse. The deficits are totally out of control. It's been argued over many years in this country that very frequently, when economic conditions get very bad in this country, the presidents have a tendency to try to distract us from our domestic problems. I mean, how much have you heard about savings and loan crisis lately? I mean, most people are still concentrating right now on the Middle East. So uh, this, uh, this, I think, uh, uh, is something worth considering. Uh, whether or not that actually occurred, we don't know. But 
it's going to make it much, much worse. I mean, not only do we think it's wrong, but we think it's going to be very detrimental to the domestic economy, and obviously the markets think so. Uh, the dollar generally responds in world crises by going up. That's when we had a dollar uh, as good as gold, and it was a sound dollar. But today, the dollar is on its last legs. It's our economy in this country is on its last legs, just as the Soviet uh, economy in, in Eastern Europe had been, uh, has been, and it's collapsed. So I think an event like this can be a total disaster, not only in foreign policy, and lead to many, many deaths of young men for no real good reason, but it's also maybe the precipitating event of not only a mild recession, but I'm really concerned enough to think that it could precipitate a depression in this country. Does the Libertarian Party still believe, as I guess has been argued in the past, uh, that we should be on the gold standard? And what would that mean um, in the current uh, economic situation? Well, you wouldn't, under a gold standard, you wouldn't have any inflation because you wouldn't allow a government monopoly, the Federal Reserve, to print money out of thin air. I mean, there's the problem. You have a Congress that votes themselves uh, largesse, that is, give the people whatever they want, they keep themselves in office, they build these political power bases, then they really don't have to act responsible about collecting any money to pay the bills. They just go and print it, send the Treasury bills to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve creates the credit. That's inflation. The in money supply goes up, the value of the dollar goes down, and prices go up, and then it distorts the economy. So yes, we want a sound, honest monetary standard. It doesn't mean that we demand that the government institute a gold standard, but we demand honesty in money, that money be something sound and honest, something that no one can counterfeit. Not only individuals in a libertarian society, individuals can't counterfeit, but neither can government counterfeit. Today, individuals, correctly, aren't allowed to counterfeit but we have legalized counterfeit by the Federal Reserve, condoned by the Congress, a very, very dangerous economic uh, monetary system. You served four terms in Congress. Um, when did you come and when did you leave? I was first elected uh, on our 200th anniversary of our Declaration of Independence in 1776, and I served four terms and left in 1984. During that time, uh, mainly served on the banking committee, very interested in banking and monetary affairs. And prior to that, were you a practicing physician? Yes, practiced uh, obstetrics and gynecology in the town of Lake Jackson near Houston and continue to do that. Let's go to our first phone call. Again, in case you've just tuned in, we're visiting with uh, former Congressman Ron Paul, who is also uh, the Libertarian Party's candidate for president uh, in 1988. 1988, right. Let's go back to the phones. Charlotte, North Carolina, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Thank you, Ed. My, uh, I have a few comments first to Mr. Paul and then uh, one observation that I'd like him to speak on. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a sister that is in Kuwait uh, and she has two children over there and he said that Kuwait has only been carved out for about seven years. Seventy. Seventy years, okay. Uh, if you'll go back through history though, the uh, family that is in rule in Kuwait has ruled there uh, for uh, several centuries. Uh, and in fact, that area, even before it was divided by the British, that area that is now known as Kuwait was in fact uh, separated to some extent as a providence and was ruled by that family. Um, when you take into consideration uh, what Saddam Hussein has done in an aggressive, brutal invasion of Kuwait, uh, unprovoked by Kuwait, uh, then you're talking about a man who has basically lost all morals and and all reasoning for international law. Is that sort of like invading Panama, Grenada, and bombing Libya? No, there's a lot of difference there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, there is. <laughs> uh, Panama, first of all, uh, and, well, Libya, first of all, was the home for uh, terrorist-based attacks and things like that. Panama. Oh, was, yeah, but that was incorrect. That was never proven. Uh, uh, that Syria might have done those things that they were blamed for. So that is not the way a free society operates, nor is it permitted under our Constitution. Well, you've got to look at the big picture, and I, am. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's kind of—I like, I hate to belittle it to a game, but you've got to look on it as sort of like a game of chess. You plan your moves, many moves ahead, and uh, for us to say—and that's what I would basically like for you to speak on—is uh, you said that we should just stay home and keep our nose out of it; that it's really none of our business. But uh, when does it become our business? When this man has uh, obtained uh, nuclear weapons? When this man has? Uh, gone further than Kuwait, which there is probability that he may or may not mm -hmm. have, uh, but just from his actions. Okay. 
Well, I think we become concerned when he threatens our national security. I believe the American people and your relatives now are much more threatened and much more in danger because we're over there than they would be if we have not, had not gone over there. They would not be hostages. They only became hostages after we declared war and, uh, and started keeping food and medicine away from the children of Iraq. So I would say that uh, for us to develop a foreign policy designed to uh, protect kingdoms, I mean, what kind of civil liberties do they have in Kuwait or Saudi Arabia? A few years ago, Saudi Arabia organized a boycott against the United States. Just a few months ago, we gave money and support and subsidies and helicopters and technology to this horrible Hitler of Iraq. So it's this foolishness of on again, off again, support one time and change our minds. So it's just amazing to me how the American people can get riled up so quickly. And yet, if they would only look at history, heck, just a short time ago, here we were supporting this guy. And why is it that we are going to sacrifice American lives to restore a kingdom? A kingdom and a king has no respect for freedom of religion or freedom of press. Uh, there's no civil liberties there, and they treat, they treat women like they're in the Dark Ages. There's a story that appears on the front page of today's Washington Post. Uh, for those of you who may have access to it, and I know there are similar stories running on the uh, pages of other dailies around the country. This one is entitled Imperialist Legacy, Lines in the Sand, which uh, reviews the history of how the borders were drawn of Kuwait and Iraq and the rest of the countries in the Middle East. Uh, some of you, you viewers may find that interesting. Let's go back to the phones. Haddon Heights, New Jersey, thanks for standing by. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Paul, it just so happened this afternoon I was reading a, uh, a periodical called Conservative Review and an article by uh, Llewellyn Rockwell called Realignment on the Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not greatly familiar. I have some interest in the Libertarian Party. Uh, and uh, in the article, he talks about a split among the libertarians. There being leftist libertarians or left libertarians who are hostile to religion, family, community, tradition, as opposed to some of the values that the people out at uh, the uh, Rockford uh, Institute have. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Is this so? Or have you read the article, by the way? I don't know whether I've read that particular article, but I'm certainly aware of that debate going on in the Libertarian Party. It, it does exist. I think a small party that's philosophically oriented, uh, and those individuals who join a party like that are very, very philosophic and determined, and therefore you will have serious debates of different factions. Uh, Lou Rockwell is concerned about a very serious problem in that sometimes it is perceived that libertarians who permit free choices literally or would then therefore endorse all those choices. For instance, our position in the party and my position is that we think there's no advantage to having these drug laws. We think there's a lot of disadvantages. So therefore, we take the position that we're for legalization of drugs and we don't like to interfere in the personal private sexual habits of adults. So uh, by saying that, does that mean that I endorse certain sexual practices such as prostitution. Uh, do I endorse the use of drugs? No, on a personal level I don't. But you can see those individuals that may be persecuted because they endorse certain activity that we don't want to make illegal would then uh, be wanting to associate with the Libertarian Party. And Mr. Rockwell's point is, is that we as Libertarians have to make our program attractive to the average person in the street because, for instance, libertarians are very tolerant of all religions and they're even tolerant of atheists. But that doesn't mean that we should be a party of atheists. So therefore, we should have an appeal to everyone and those people especially who have religious beliefs should feel comfortable and should feel protected in the Libertarian Party. 